Welcome to Pick Up and Deliver, the podcast where I pick up my audio recorder as I step off the train and deliver an episode to you while I walk home. I'm Brendan Riley. Well, good morning, good afternoon, listeners. It's a lovely day here in suburban Chicago. I'm on the way home from work, and I thought that I would chat with you about board games a little bit. So today I am going to be talking about a couple games I've played recently for the first time. That's right, it's time for Board Game Expresso Triple Shot. I don't know why I made that noise. Actually, I do. I used to use a different name. Let's try that again. It's time for Board Game Expresso Espresso Triple Shot. Uh, For those of you new to this podcast, the Board Game Espresso Espresso episodes represent a chance to talk about games that I've encountered for the first time recently. This sort of first impressions episode. Uh, in the game I will, or in the episode, I will be talking about three games that I played for the first time recently and one game that I dusted off. And I'll be giving you just uh, my initial thoughts on these games. These aren't full reviews because obviously I haven't played them very much. So the first game I want to talk about is Scythe Expeditions, or just called Expeditions. It's in the Scythe universe, but it is not actually called Scythe. It's just called Expeditions. Uh, this is a game designed by Jamie Stegmeier and... Uh, published by uh, Stonemaier Games, art by Jacob Rosalski. Expeditions takes place in the same sort of uh, steampunk world that happened, uh, that takes place post-World War I that Scythe is in. Uh, and in this game, you are investigating the strange wasteland that occurs after the Tunguska Blast. The Tunguska Blast is a mysterious explosion that happened in the uh, Arctic part of the Ukraine or this or Siberia in which hundreds of thousands of trees were knocked down and uh, a fire may or may not have happened it was years after it happened that people that in the real world people got there to investigate so prevailing theory that I'm familiar with is that it was a meteor strike or an, uh, or an asteroid came in and it got superheated by entering the atmosphere and then exploded in the air and caused this explosion or this uh, damage but people don't really know. Uh, fun fact, the Tunguska Blast is one of the things I first learned about it from Ray in Ghostbusters when he was talking about different mysterious phenomena. He talks about the Tunguska Blast. So in Expeditions, you play representatives of the competing countries at, that have a stake in the world uh, of Scythe, and you are leading an expedition to explore the area contaminated by the blast. The idea is that the meteor that landed had a mutagenic property of some sort, and so it caused all kinds of disruptions to the ecosystem. It caused animal mutations and uh, all sorts of other problems. The, the game is uh, a little bit of pick up and deliver um, and uh, a little bit of economic or action management as you are trying to achieve your goal as efficiently as possible. It borrows something from Scythe that is a sort of key part of how that game works in Scythe if you haven't played it. There are these action markers. And each time you take a turn, you have to move your action marker from one space to another, meaning you can never use the same action twice in a row. That idea is continued in Expeditions, with the exception of if you do a reset action, then you return components, uh, you sort of reset your board, and that's all you do. You do all three actions on the turn after you reset, and then you go back to doing two actions per turn, I think. It's been a little bit, but you get the idea. Anyhow, and the, the actual play of the game involves trying to find a variety of resources and use those resources to get different kinds of treasure or uh, tools that will then help you accomplish goals and get points. The goal of the game is to accomplish these different objectives that get you stars. And if you remember from Scythe, the number is having a certain number of stars triggers the end of the game and then you score points based on those stars. Now in Expeditions, 
in order to gain a star, you have to boast about something you've done. And so you, there's a two-step process by which you have to meet the condition for a star. And then you have to go take a boast action in order to actually earn the star, which was a complication that I found kind of annoying. I imagine that the game loses a lot of its tension if you're able to just get the star as soon as you achieve it. It probably goes too fast, but I'm not sure that having an action you have to take to earn a star is my favorite. I wonder if you, if you played it more, I wonder if you could telegraph too easily when somebody is going to win based on that. Um, the other mechanism in the game that's pretty interesting is this idea of having a row of cards and then having different kinds of activations that happen when you play cards out of your hand. Uh, this is actually my other complaint about the game. It uses the terminology hand to describe the group of cards to the left of your player board. All of your, player, all of your cards are always on the table. You have the cards on the left of the board and the cards on the right of the board. The cards on the left of the board are available to be played. The cards on the right of the board have been played. When you play a card, you often can add a worker to it if you have the right kind of worker, and then you get a bonus. Uh, and then the card goes on to the right side, and sometimes it will create an ongoing power, or uh, it'll give you a one-time bonus or something like that. The cards on the left side of the board, like I said, are available to be played. You can also acquire new cards by taking a certain action on the board, and so on and so on. When you do the reset action I was talking about, you pick up the cards from the right side of the board and put them down on the left side of the board. And the whole time, the game refers to the cards on the left side of the board as your hand. This was eminently frustrating to me when I learned it, and I'm, I'm not happy about it. All in all, Expeditions is a fine game. It's fun. I would happily play it if someone asked me to. It doesn't rise to the level of, oh man, I gotta have that in my collection, or even if I didn't know someone who has it, I would get it, which is kind of where, that's kind of where a scythe is, right? I like scythe. I would enjoy having that in my collection, but I know at least two different people, maybe three, who have it and with whom I can easily play games. So with that much access to it, I don't feel the need to own it myself. Uh, Expeditions is that same way. I have a friend who has it. That's how I got to play it. Um, but in terms of on the scale of games that I want to have, it's, it's just in the middle. It's fine. And I would definitely urge you to try it if you get a chance, but it doesn't have quite that magic that Scythe has for me. All right, so that was Expeditions. The next game I want to talk about is That Time You Killed Me. That Time You Killed Me is a game that got a whole bunch of buzz when it first came out, and then I didn't hear much about it after that for a while. Um, I just happened to play it once with a friend of mine, and we thought, oh, that'll be fun to try some more. And then Gabriel, hey Gabriel, has invited me to play it on Board Game Arena, and we're playing it there, and he's kicking my butt. Well done, sir. Uh, it's designed by Peter C. Hayward and published by Pandasaurus Games. Uh, that Time You Killed Me is sort of a chess variant. I mean, it's not a chess variant. It is an abstract game that uh, you have four, three boards that are four by four, so 16 spaces. And the idea is the board on the left, or the board on one side, is the early board. The board in the middle is the middle board, and the board on the right is the late board. And these are, it's a time travel thing. So you have this idea of uh, you, if you move forward, you just move your piece forward. If you move back, you actually make a copy of your piece and send it backwards. And then those two copies can run around separately. Uh, these are your clones. And the goal of the game is to eliminate the other player either entirely or I think from two of the three boards at the beginning of your turn is I think how it goes. I'd have to go look again. Uh, there are relatively simple rules for capturing. Uh, you can push a piece off the board and that will capture it. Or you can push a piece into one of its own pieces. So if you have two of my white pieces next to each other and you push one of them into the other, uh, they're both captured uh, because two clones can't occupy the same space. It causes a temporal rift or something. Uh, there are scenarios that will emerge as you play. Um, so each game you play, something gets added to the game. Apparently, I haven't gone down that road very far yet, but uh, it's interesting. It does take a bit of time to think about, so I, I have a feeling I'm going to be losing to Gabriel for a while before I start to get the feel for the move, how the game moves, and what are good and bad choices in playing. 
nonetheless, it's interesting, and I'm looking forward to playing some more on Board Game Arena or with my friend who has a copy. Um, the components are nice, although fairly standard black and white boards with kind of funky chess pawns as the pieces. The theme is great, and the, the art, as much as there is, there's not much, but the art, as much as there is, is Quanchai Morio, which is always a, a plus for me. So uh, definitely, again, a recommend to try. This is That Time You Killed Me. If it's the sort of thing that sounds like it's really up your alley, it probably is. Uh, I don't tend to play a ton of, of abstract games, so or buy them anyway, so I'm not sure this would be on my shopping list, but especially if you have somebody you like to play complex abstract games with, That Time You Killed Me really would fit the bill for that kind of game. So that is That Time You Killed Me by Peter C. Hayward in Pandasaurus Games. Right, the next game I want to uh, go to is the game I dusted off this month, or one of them, and that's Coimbra. Uh, Coimbra I mentioned I picked up at a game store in Canada, because they happen to have a copy, and it's a game that I really like, but I haven't played in a long time, because the person I know who owns it moved away. I, in fact, I've since talked to them, and they said, oh yeah, they got rid of it. I was like, no, you got rid of Coimbra? No! I had resisted buying it, or I hadn't bought it, in part because I felt like I had access to a copy, mentally. Like, mentally, I had a, an idea in my head that I had, an ac I had access to a copy, even though the friend that owned it had, had moved away, and it turns out now didn't even have it anymore. So, I finally did decide to pick up a copy, and boy, I really like this game. At its heart is a really interesting decision to be made. Uh, on your turn, you're going to be... So it's, it's played in a number of rounds. There is a, uh, a drafting round and a uh, purchasing round. Uh, in the drafting round, you are putting out dice to bid for different um, uh, cards. And the cards represent different kinds of different people you're gaining sway with. They also give you either one-time bonuses or ongoing bonuses. Uh, and they raise your influence with certain groups of people. Then you recruit the cards and you have to pay the amount on the die in order to recruit them, which can be very tricky. Or no, you don't, you don't pay the amount on the die, you pay the amount on the card. The cards that you get will raise your influence with different groups and that it all comes down to end game scoring. The game has a variable scoring based on a track where you move around and you gain bonuses, based on a whole bunch of different ways that you can use these cards. Uh, and at the end of the game, you get points based on kind of how high you went up on this track and the multipliers for these different kinds of action. Uh, it's a very thinky game, really, really cool. I love the double use. So I, like I said, you use dice to bid, uh, and then the color of the die that you take to bid with gives you one kind of resource, and the value on it gives you another number. And so you're using these dice in multiple ways which I think works really well as you then go through the rounds of, of drafting cards and so on. The biggest downside to the game is it is language independent, which means all the cards just have symbols on them and they can be pretty tricky to read until you can learn what the symbols mean. So be very careful the first time you play. And this was a mistake I made. I didn't really have player aids for everybody and that was a blunder. Uh, but Coimbra is really good. I like it a lot and I'm glad to have it in my collection. Uh, Coimbra. Finally, the last game I wanted to mention today is After Us. Um, After Us is a game that a friend of mine picked up at uh, Gen Con, and we got to play it while we were there. Um, it is an engine builder, pretty a pretty pure engine builder. Uh, the way the game works, you have a token that you can use to activate one of four different troops of monkeys, and you have a series of cards that's a deck builder. And you lay those cards out in order on the table, and each card has a series of boxes that represent different kinds of uh, resources and actions. If you connect two boxes uh, in a way that closes in the box, so some of the boxes on the cards are like, you have three sides on the card and one side that opens up. If you connect that to another card that has a box open that opens up, then the two together result in uh, being able to get to activate those powers. Uh, it, it's a really neat system that works very well. The four different colors of cards represent four different kinds of apes or monkeys, and those apes or monkeys uh, give you different kinds of resources. Narratively, human beings are gone from the planet and apes have taken over, uh, and so you're trying to build up a troop of apes that has the most points. 
there is a neat mechanism by which when you take your action, the other players get to take a minor version of that action, or the other players can spend a resource to take that action as well. Um, so there's an interesting element by which you want to get that you want to get that resource that lets you take the extra actions so that you can, you know, take extra actions. After you activate all your cards, then you recruit new cards and uh, you get points and money and resources and you go again. You do several rounds of this and the player who's acquired the most stuff wins. Uh, the big downside to After Us is that you never, you very rarely interact with the other players and there's nothing in which direct interaction happens at all. Uh, because the cards are all drawn from decks, you're not even competing for stuff in the market. You're just drawing off the top of the card, so you have no idea whether the card you're getting now is better than the card they're going to take or what. So they're really, the only interaction is do you use their action when they take an action, or do you not? Um, so that was, the, that was the big downside of that game for me. I thought the engine building aspect of it was really fun. It was very satisfying, really quick game. Uh, it was the card, the cards, the boxes that connect across the cards was an interesting choice to make and made for uh, solid and interesting discussions. But ultimately, uh, the game would have worked better for me if there was a little more interaction. Nonetheless, a uh, fun time. If you get a chance to try After Us, I do recommend. The art is lovely. It's um, Vincent Dutrait art with apes with guns and stuff, so that's always fun. Well, that's uh, my Board Game Espresso Espresso episode. Those are three games I played recently. Uh, thanks for joining me on my walk today. I hope that your next walk is as pleasant as mine was. Bye-bye. Brought to you by Rattlebox Games.